As I mentioned in my previous Zelda video, my first and most consumed form of entertainment as a child was children's literature. Part of that was the ease and acceptability I found when it came to reading. My parents somewhat successfully set restrictions on how long I could watch TV, and then eventually play video games, a day. However, there were no such restrictions on how long I could spend reading every day. I found the same acceptance in school. Other kids would get in all sorts of trouble for trying to play their Game Boys anywhere on school property, but my teachers were positively delighted by my interest in reading during downtimes. No one was ever mad when I was a child and would break out a book to read when bored. In fact, adults would often heap praise upon my parents for how wonderful it was that I was so interested in literature and how well behaved this made me appear. In retrospect, I think a lot of that praise came from the fact that a child reading is usually pretty quiet and still. And as a kid, this unwavering adult support of my hobby always surprised me a bit. I kind of understood that reading was a good way to increase a child's vocabulary and encourage critical thinking and imagination, but to me, books were just a form of storytelling that I could get away with consuming a lot. Sure, I liked reading, but I liked watching television and movies just as much. There were just way more restrictions on me consuming those types of stories than the ones I found in books. Because that's really what it came down to. Stories. I just liked experiencing stories, and used whatever medium I could to consume those stories. I got caught reading during class just as often as kids who were trying to play handheld video games in class got caught. It's just that when I was reprimanded, I was only told to put my book away and pay attention while the Game Boy kids got sent to the principal's office. This difference in reaction always struck me as so bizarre, but I was definitely not above exploiting it to my advantage. So I read as much as I could because I could get away with it. As a result, I read a lot of children's fiction. A lot. And as times passed, so many of those books have become this jumbled amorphous singularity in my memory, full of little moments that I know I must have read in a book somewhere, but can't specifically remember from where because the honest truth is the vast majority of books I read as a kid were not very good to only average. So much children's literature is incredibly basic, or incredibly similar to the few breakout hits in the genre. But there are exceptions, those books that I can still remember keenly to this day for either being really good, or really weird, or, more often than not, a compelling mix of the two. The best books I've ever read are almost all exclusively written for adults, but the most influential books I've ever read are almost all written for children. Good children's literature not only tells engaging stories, but instills an actual love for the reading process as well. I initially started out treating reading as just a vehicle for consuming stories, but by adulthood, this means to an end had transformed into a genuine love for the action of reading. I love reading today because so many of the books I read as a kid helped nurture and grow that love. This has also tended to be the case for other book lovers I've run into in my life. Their love for reading almost always resulted from them falling in love with books as a child. Unfortunately, that's a bit uncommon in the U.S. According to a 2016 study by Pew Research, the average American reads a median of four books a year, with one in four Americans not reading any books at all in the last 12 months. A lot of Americans just don't like to read. Period. I experienced this firsthand with a friend of mine in college. He and I were chatting, and when the topic of reading came up, he expressed disappointment in the fact he rarely ever reads for pleasure. When I pressed him about it, he said it wasn't because he hated books. Like me. He really enjoys good stories, and he's very aware that some of the best stories ever told are in literature. He just doesn't like the actual act of reading, of moving his eyes across the page word by word, or as I've seen it referred to online, staring at some dead trees for a while and hallucinating. He simply doesn't enjoy the physical process of reading, and I think this feeling is pretty common across the US. Just look at Game of Thrones. Sure, the books have sold very well, but there are huge portions of the American population that never would have and never will read them. But the immense popularity of HBO's adaptation of the series proves that it's not the story that most people don't find compelling. Rather, it's actually having to read the story that they dislike. And I think a lot of those feelings come from how many Americans are taught to read and are introduced to the concept of books. Reading is a school subject for almost the entirety of a student's life in the U.S. school system, and many children will build a dislike to it specifically because it's a school subject, something they're forced to learn and repeat for graded evaluations. Combine that with the fact that most books kids have to read in school are mandatory assigned reading books that the students have very little say in choosing, and I completely understand why many adults today don't enjoy reading. For me, reading was a means to an end for consuming stories I wanted to experience. For many others, it was a mandatory obligation that they were evaluated and punished on. Not a great way to instill a love of the medium, especially in children. So I really don't believe that Americans who don't like to read just don't like stories. The immense popularity of movies and television directly disproves that. TV and movies are just stories presented in an easier-to-consume form. Viewers of these mediums aren't constrained by their vocabularies or actual speed of reading. All they have to do is just sit, 
watch, and listen. It's no wonder, then, that streaming services and their popularity and usage are booming, all while bookstores are closing across the country. Consumers still want stories, but since technology has advanced to where it is today, people no longer have to rely on books and reading to get these stories. They can just throw on Netflix instead. I'm not looking to make any Rostradamus-level predictions about the future of books and literature here, but I do think that in the coming years the world will see more storytellers choose to tell their stories through filmed mediums over telling these stories through writing. Filmed media is just so much more and widely consumed in the world, and most storytellers just want their stories to be experienced. I can't fault them for going with the most popular vehicles for these stories. Books used to be the best and most popular way to have people's stories distributed and consumed. Today, that's just no longer the case. I know some people will interpret this medium shift as nothing but a travesty, the awful dumbing down of entertainment and art. I don't agree with that mindset. Not because there isn't some small kernel of truth there, as I do believe reading takes a lot more critical thinking and imagination than just watching TV or a movie, but because I think the storytelling shift is inevitable. Stories used to exist solely as verbal narratives until writing came along. And when the printing press became popularized and the materials to make books became cheaper and more widely available, storytellers shifted to writing their stories out as books rather than as spoken tales, and solely verbal storytelling kind of dissipated. When's the last time any of you have gone to see a storyteller in person and have them verbally recount their story to you? Sure, theater's still around today, but it's a niche form of entertainment and tends to focus on delivering experiences that are uniquely enjoyable to a live performance over just reading about those same experiences in a book. And now with filmed content reaching a point of very affordable entry and results, I think video's slowly going to do to the book what the book did to the bard. Not kill, but supersede as the most popular entertainment medium of choice. Sure, writing a book will maybe always be easier than filming that same story, as writing a book still is the easiest and cheapest entry into storytelling, what with the author only truly needing themselves in a word processor. But the most talented storytellers of the day might forgo writing their story as a book like they may have in the past in favor of having that story be told through video. And like I said, I can't fault any storyteller for choosing to tell their story through the medium that it will be consumed the most. Storytellers want their stories told and experienced. That's why they tell them. But I hope literature doesn't become completely overshadowed by its video sibling, because I think books still present some of the best vehicles for telling stories, many which would be nowhere near as enjoyable if told in another manner. Books can present multiple characters' perspectives, along with the unspoken thoughts of those characters as well. They can contain character-building downtime that would be deemed unacceptable by many film and television standards. Books provide instant references for rereading something if it wasn't understood the first time, and it's infinitely easier to look up an unknown term that you encounter while reading than it is to try to guess how to spell a word someone in film content says that you don't know. And like I said earlier, some of the best stories ever told are books. And if Hollywood's taught me anything, for every one good adaptation of a written story to film, there exists four other terrible adaptations. Some stories are just better told as books. So this is why I think good children's literature is important, because it not only tells an enjoyable story, but in doing so encourages the reader to experience so many other countless wonderful stories too. I truly believe that if children can get hooked on reading when they're young, they'll carry that love with them their whole life, which will allow them to experience some of the best stories ever told. Good kids' books are just that important. And so moving forward, I have a bunch of videos planned on the children's novels that were so good that they still resonate with me today to highlight these literary accomplishments. I also hope these videos can be a gateway for some people who aren't strong readers but are interested in getting better. Children's literature, by definition, is easier to read, consume, and understand than books written solely for adults. But I've found the best kids' books are also still very enjoyable to read as an adult. For an example, you need look no further than the mega-success that is the Harry Potter series. The Harry Potter books are explicitly written for children, but were still hugely popular with adults because they were just that well written. A good children's book might make use of a simpler vocabulary than their adult contemporaries, but at the end of the day, a good story is a good story. Good children's literature is easier and faster to consume, and weaker readers might find these books the perfect stepping stones to reading more advanced writings. Now with all that being said, may I introduce one of my favorite books I read as a child, a novel that still very much holds up today, Artemis Fowl by Oin Colfer. Published in 2001, the book follows the story of Artemis Fowl, a 12-year-old criminal genius who, accompanied by his bodyguard extraordinaire, Butler, embark on a heist to steal gold from the fairy people. But it's the 21st century, and fairies have long since left that Tinkerbell crap behind. No more frivolously flitting through gardens for these guys. These fairies, collectively known as the People, 
instead live in a futuristic metropolis deep underground, and have specific police departments to deal with invasive humans like Fal. But Artemis isn't a criminal genius for nothing, and soon his plans and scheming place him in a head-on conflict with Captain Holly Short and Commander Julius Root of the Lep Recon Unit of the Fairy Lower Elements Police, as the people realize they're not dealing with just any criminal mastermind. Artemis Fowl is fun, witty, and suspenseful as the drama unfolds chapter by chapter. Colfer's writing is very funny and enjoyable to read, and he does a great job at keeping the story's tension up until the very last page. Artemis never strays into over-the-top obnoxious child prodigy territory, and the reader is frequently shown how under all of his posturing and scheming, he's still a 12-year-old kid at heart. His assistant butler is a wonderful change from the normal stuffy, uptight butler figures of other stories, and gets to be a very enjoyable character in his own right. And who can forget the fairy folk? who Colfer does a wonderful job of adapting fairy myths of the past to create the familiar but wholly unique people of his story. Holly Short comes across as genuine and dedicated while still remaining grounded enough to snark at what's going on around her. Commander Root walks that fine line of always being on the verge of chewing someone in the precinct out and deeply caring for the safety and well-being of his officers. Throw in a supporting cast of delightful personalities and what you get is a great quick little read that keeps the fun and intrigue up all the way to the end. I can't recommend it enough. And if you're interested in the story, but don't have a ton of time available to read it, the audiobook recording of the novel narrated by Nathaniel Parker is a joy to listen to as well. Parker does a wonderful job bringing the book to life. So good of a job, in fact, that to this day I read some of the dialogue in his voice, including my favorite line in the whole book. You can't get us all, Stumpy! Artemis Fowl is a delight, and I can't recommend it enough to anyone looking for a nice quick bit of fun. Do yourself a favor and check it out if any of my description has appealed to you. I promise you won't regret it. Now with all that being said, I'd like to discuss the soon-to-be-released Disney movie adaptation of It and the second book in the series. To do so, I'm going to have to dive pretty deep into the novel and its plot and details, so if you are interested in the book and want to experience it unspoiled for the first time, please don't watch the rest of this video. I'd rather you enjoy the book than the rest of this. For everybody else, let's talk about this upcoming adaptation. I should be delighted that a film adaptation of Artemis Fowl is being released August 9th, 2019. I really should. The concept of a film adaptation of the novel has been floating around Hollywood since 2001. I remember even seeing a teaser for it in theaters, a little clip of text on a golden background, like the first book's cover, that I can't seem to locate nowadays. And then... nothing ever materialized. Year by year went by with no word of a release date, or heck, even a cast. And as time went on, I gave up hope on ever seeing a film version come to fruition. So imagine my surprise when in 2013, Disney announced they were producing a movie version of the book. And imagine my even greater surprise as they continued to announce information about it, like a director, and a cast, and even eventually a release date. Artemis Fowl, a story I'd long resigned to languishing in development hell for the rest of my life, was actually going to be made into a movie. I should be filled with giddy anticipation at seeing such a beloved and important book from my childhood finally reaching the silver screens like I'd always dreamed it would. Instead, I'm stuck with a feeling of dread. Some of this was to be expected. Of course, after the reality of Disney actually making the movie set in, there were bound to be concerns over just exactly how they were going to adapt the novel into film. But this concern is a little more deep-seated, as I've seen far too many unique and enjoyable children's books adapted into samey and generic flicks that bomb so hard at the box office that the possibility of any sequels are dashed long before the movie even finishes its tenure in theaters and all the details I can find about Disney's upcoming film do nothing to assuage those fears. Let's start with the most general fear first. The Walt Disney Corporation is making this film adaptation. Disney's not known for making very nuanced children's movies. Beloved, yes, but nuanced, no. This can be keenly seen in their features' villains. A Disney villain is unceremoniously and objectively evil. Full stop. Scar is just straight evil. Gaston is just straight evil. Ursula is just straight evil. Jafar is just straight evil. Hans is just straight evil. None of these characters have the slightest step to them whatsoever. Oh sure, the movie will sometimes trick or lead the viewers on that these characters aren't bad guys. But by the end of the film, the audience has always resoundingly been assured that these characters are nothing but evil and should 100% be defeated by the hero, with no sympathy given to them or their beliefs. Disney villains also tend to be cartoonishly evil. I mean that in both the sense that they're always over the top, theatrically beat you in the face with it evil, but also in the sense that their evil is generally pretty simple and, when compared to real-life atrocities, pretty tame. Jafar, when he gains his incredible magic powers, doesn't just up and spontaneously combust Aladdin. 
Cruella de Vil doesn't just bust in and murder the Dalmatian owners in their home so she can steal their dogs. Instead, these guys tend to exist in a kid-friendly realm of evil, where nothing too atrocious might happen and traumatize the kids in the audience so badly that they hate the movie and don't get their parents to buy its associated merchandise for them. For Pete's sake, just look at 1995's Pocahontas, a film based off of real-life events that brushes away the very purposeful and aggressive genocide of an indigenous people by foreign invaders as just one bad egg amongst the European settlers. Smallpox blankets? Never heard of them! Disney's been making children's movies since the beginning that can be boiled down to obvious good guy defeats obvious bad guy and this is good, and their output of late has made no indication that they plan on changing that anytime soon. Which has me very worried for the film version of Artemis Fowl, because that book has a pretty unusual villain. Oin Colfer himself described the story of Artemis Fowl as Die Hard with Fairies. For those unfamiliar with Die Hard, it's the story of everyman police officer John McClane being trapped in the Nakatomi Corporation skyscraper while antagonist Hans Gruber and his terrorist lackeys attempt to steal a bunch of money from a secure vault in the building, all while holding the employees of the Nakatomi Corporation hostage. Now, it's not a perfect one-for-one -one translation of Artemis Fowl and its characters, but you can definitely see the comparison Colfer was trying to make. Holly Short is a member of the Fairy Police Force and is trapped in Fowl Manor against her will, so she's John McClane. Fowl Manor would be the Nakatomi building, so that means the Han Gruber villain character who's obsessed with trying to steal some money and who John McClane is determined to stop would be... well, Artemis Fowl, the protagonist of the book. See, this is one of the reasons Artemis Fowl stood out to me so much as a kid over all the other guff I read. Artemis Fowl is the villain of the novel. Sure, he's not evil, but he's definitely the bad guy. He kidnaps Holly, he holds her hostage, and he engages in the fairy equivalent of a police shootout with the Lower Elements Police. It's part of what makes this book so good. Artemis isn't your typical children's book main character, and that's what makes him so interesting and unique. But like I've said, Disney children's features don't do nuance at all, let alone well, which leaves me very worried for how they're going to portray Artemis as the protagonist of the film, as well as the villain. Now put a pin in that thought for a second. Another big issue I'm worried about is the pacing of the movie. Kenneth Branagh is directing the film, and instead of just adapting the first novel, he's adapting the first two books in the series into one feature-length film which has me very nervous, as Hollywood's previous attempt at condensing more than one book from a beloved children's series into one movie did not go well. At all. I hate it when directors do this kind of thing, because it throws off the pacing of the whole story. The first Artemis Fowl book has a very discernible beginning, middle, and end. The second Artemis Fowl book, The Arctic Incident, also has a very discernible beginning, middle, and end. So without some heavy editing and changes, a straight film adaptation of these two novels would have two openings, two climaxes, and two finales. This is obviously very undesirable for a probably two-hour-ish feature film, so to fit everything in, Kenneth's going to have to cut a lot out of the story to make the film work. Which isn't inherently bad, as adaptations almost always have to make cuts somewhere, but it's very confusing. Like I said, the first Artemis Fowl has a very discernible beginning, middle, and end, and doesn't end on some sort of cliffhanger that would piss the audience off if the movie version of the book concluded like it too. There's plenty of material in the first book to make a feature-length film out of. Why combine the two? You'd think that in an era of film franchises, Disney would want to keep as many possible sequels available as possible just in case this movie is a smash hit and audiences demand more. It's a pretty strange move, right? I have a theory why Disney and Kenneth are choosing to do the first movie this way, but put a pin in that too, we'll come back to it in a little bit. My final worry with the film adaptation are the changes to the source material that we already know. And I want to make something clear before we jump in. I am not against the idea of adaptations modifying the source material to fit the director's vision, or to better adapt the story for film. I used to be the guy who got upset whenever a movie based on a book changed anything, but that's because I have been kind of stupid about various things at various points in my life. Film and literature, while both storytelling engines, tell and present stories in very different ways. A straight adaptation of a book to a movie very frequently doesn't result in an enjoyable film, just an accurate one. I'd rather watch a good movie based on a work I like than a bad but meticulous movie based on a work I like. With that being said, I'm a bit concerned about the changes to the original source material that Kenneth's already announced. There's already the combination of the first two books into one story, but there's a little more than that. Per two Bustle.com articles, Disney and Kenneth have already outlined some pretty significant deviations from the book. Let's start with one of the more unusual changes, the decision to have Judy Dench play Commander Root, which can be found detailed in the Bustle article titled Disney's Artemis Fowl movie cast includes a gender swap that will make fans so pleased, which... 
Look, Bustle.com, I think you mean well. Really, I do. I'm not heartbroken over the gender swapping question, but that title and the line immediately following it? Disney announced Artemis Fowl casting that includes a gender swap not even the most loyalist fans could complain about. Alright, you've obviously decided having Dench play a previously male role is a good thing, and that's totally within your rights, but you're pretty naive to think no Artemis Fowl fan will be upset that a previously male character will now be female. Just saying something doesn't make it true. It makes me think you've never been online before, because if you had, you'd know a huge chunk of the internet is made up of raging misogynists that will throw a fit whenever any once male character is made female. But yeah, Judy Dench is now playing Commander Root. The article goes on to say, This switch is perfect, however. After all, Root and Holly have a special bond in the books, and the fact that they will both be facing the sexism of being one of the few women on the Force will only make their connection even stronger in the movie. Perfect? Bustle.com, this swap, from a story perspective, is very much less than perfect. It actually throws a couple major wrenches into the story's plot. One of Holly Short's characteristics in Artemis Fowl is that she is the first female officer in Lep Recon history. This does lead to Holly experiencing sexism in the precinct, but funny thing about that, Bustle.com, that sexism comes from Commander Root. In fact, Root is just about to bump Holly from Lep Recon in the beginning of the story for pretty obviously sexist sentiments before an emergency flares up and causes the book's plot to really kick off. But if Root's female now, Holly's no longer the first female Leprechaun officer, because Root used to be Leprechaun, so that would have made her the first female Leprechaun officer, which kind of takes a bunch of wind out of Holly's sails. Holly wouldn't then always be on double secret probation with Root either for being a female, which mucks up the whole beginning of the book too. Kenneth Branagh addresses some of these adaptation obstacles in the other Bustle.com article titled The Artemis Fowl Movie Changes Some Characters, but director Kenneth Branagh says it's still the story you love. Quote, Fans of the book will also note that Dench's addition to the cast means a significant change in Holly's character arc, namely that she won't be the first ever female Lep Recon commander. But Branagh is confident that fans will get to see Holly Short make her own significant mark on the Lep Recon team. We don't make life any simpler for her in terms of progress, the director says. There are plenty of obstacles systemic and sometimes male, that get in her way, and that extends, to some extent, to the character of Commander Root as well. So Holly having to fight her way to where she is at Leprechaun is still going to be around, but different. Okay, that could work. Like I said earlier, I'm not heartbroken by Root now being female, and I'm not going to pass any definitive judgment on the changes until I see the film. I'm just worried about some of the reasonings behind these changes. Take Holly, another character who will be altered from the source material. Per Bustle.com, Holly Short, the Leprechaun fairy who is captured by Artemis, has been aged down for the film. No longer an adult, she appears as a child, or tween as it were, played by young actor Laura McDonnell. It's a choice that Branu assures reporters was fueled by creative license to make Artemis less isolated, and not just the fact that it opens the door for potential sequels. Though, if Artemis Fowl fans should demand a sequel, the filmmaker admits, if it works, they can sort of grow up together. Kenneth. Buddy, with all due respect, what? Holly Short is now a tween to make Artemis less isolated? What? Holly and Artemis definitely aren't friends at the end of the first book. What with the whole him kidnapping her business and the whole her waiting for the next time Artemis commits some crime so she can be there with a big gun and smile business. And even by the end of the second book, their relationship is more grudging respect than best buds. The whole not making Artemis feel isolated bit doesn't make much sense because the books are explicitly about how Artemis' intelligence and upbringing has left him without any friends besides Butler. That's part of the reason why he starts getting into all that trouble with the fairies. He's got no one to tell him no in his life, so why not extort another entire civilization for some gold? No one's paying any attention to him anyways, so that's why he can travel the world and kidnap a fairy and then have the people respond by stopping time around his mansion and no one ever notices. And this whole Holly being a tween business, this is a pretty big change. In the novels, Holly's about 80 years old. Making her a tween's not just any little old tweak. Why the change? Yes, yes, the not having Artemis feel isolated bit. But what do you mean by that, Kenneth? I think you showed your hand a little with your whole this change is totally not just to set up potential sequels line, but then immediately go on to explain how this change is perfect for making sequels. However, I'm going to need you guys to put one more pin in the Holly business for just a moment, because there's one more major bit of information that kind of puts the bigger picture of these thoughts we've pinned into focus. The article contains a plot synopsis of the film from Disney itself. Disney's Artemis Fowl, based on the beloved book by Oin Colfer, 
is a fantastical, spellbinding adventure that follows the journey of 12-year-old genius Artemis Fowl, a descendant of a long line of criminal masterminds, as he seeks to find his father who has mysteriously disappeared. With the help of his loyal protector Butler, Artemis sets out to find him, and in doing so uncovers an ancient underground civilization, the amazingly advanced world of fairies. Deducing that his father's disappearance is somehow connected to the secretive, reclusive fairy world, cunning Artemis concocts a dangerous plan. So dangerous that he ultimately finds himself in a perilous war of wits with the all-powerful fairies. Ah. Here we go. The changes I was worried Disney was going to make look like they're part of the film. There's a pretty unfortunate trend in movie adaptations of children's books to remove or smooth down some of the odder and less conventional aspects of the source material to make it more marketable to a larger audience. In the Harry Potter books, Hermione Granger is characterized as not being super attractive. She has big, bushy brown hair and large front buck teeth. This minor unattractiveness plays an interesting part in the books, as Hermione comes across as self-conscious about her looks a couple of times, especially in The Goblet of Fire, the fourth book, where after being cursed to have her teeth grow to an even larger size, she begs the school nurse to shrink her teeth to a normal proportional size for her mouth. The Goblet of Fire also has a scene where Hermione puts a bunch of work into looking pretty for the Yule Ball, and Harry and Ron are taken aback by how good she looks, highlighting how much of a contrast this is to the way she normally appears. It's a nice little scene, and a good reminder to Harry and Ron that Hermione isn't just one of the boys. She's one of the girls, too. But the movie adaptations kind of muck all this up by casting Emma Watson in the role of Hermione Granger. Watson has always been conventionally attractive, so this change takes away from some of Hermione's personality and insecurities, and really gums up the Yule Ball scene, where the boys, instead of being caught off guard by how attractive Hermione can look, are instead now supposed to be surprised that Watson's Hermione can wear a nice dress and makeup? There's no major change in appearance for pre-Yule Ball Hermione and done-up Yule Ball Hermione in the movie, and it kind of takes some of the air out of the scene. In Warner Brothers adaptations, only bad guys can be unattractive, so now Hermione is just another conventionally attractive character in a movie full of conventionally attractive characters. Movie adaptations also have a terrible habit of forcing in romantic partners and relationships into stories that didn't previously have them, regardless of how those relationships would affect the story, because apparently major Hollywood studios don't think a movie can sell unless there's some smooching in it. Take Ender's Game, a 1985 sci-fi novel by Orson Scott Card that Lionsgate adapted into a movie in 2013. In the original story, Ender doesn't have a romantic interest in subplot, as he's just a kid who's really only ever focused on military strategy. This works fine in the book, and the story never feels like it's missing anything without a love subplot inclusion. However, the 2013 film adaptation turns one of the few female characters in the book, Petra, into a romantic interest for Ender because apparently Lionsgate decided they couldn't sell this film to audiences if they hadn't, because they wouldn't have included it in the movie if they didn't think it was going to help the film sell better. And from a story perspective, this change doesn't improve the story at all because this edition actually messes up some of the major plot points of Orson Scott Card's companion series to Ender's Game, the Shadow series, as Petra and Ender very much do not have a romantic relationship in those books. This is made all the more frustrating as Card had said before the 2013 movie that he wouldn't allow any film adaptation of his book to give Ender a love interest, yet in Gavin Hood's adaptation, that's exactly what audiences got. Ender's Game was great and unique amongst other youth novels because of what it didn't contain, as well as because of what it did. Which swings back around to Disney's Artemis Fowl adaptation. Why is Holly a tween instead of 80? There's Kenneth's isolation line, sure, but because of his following comments about this allowing Holly and Artemis to grow up together, I feel like more than anything this is just to allow Holly and Artemis to be love interests as the movies move forward. If this change was just to allow Holly and Artemis to be friends, then Disney wouldn't have had to age Holly down as Artemis already demonstrates he's able to make friends with older people through his relationship with Butler, an adult who is also his friend. There's no necessity to make Holly a tween if that's the case. The movie could have just kept her at 80. But since the first two Artemis Fowl books don't have any love interest for Artemis, and Disney is wont to make a kid's feature without including some romance subplot, this change strikes me more as a studio-driven decision to make the film more marketable to a wider audience by making Holly and Artemis love interests. This would also allow Disney to mine all that human fairy interspecies romance drama moving forward in the series. Let's look back at the decision to combine the first two books into one movie again, too. The plot of the first Artemis Fowl book is all about Artemis robbing the fairy folk of gold because he's a greedy criminal. A sympathetic greedy criminal, but a greedy criminal nonetheless. The second book is all about Artemis locating his father and helping the people with some business so they'll help him with rescuing his dad. Now let's look at Disney's plot description for their movie again. Disney's Artemis Fowl, based on the beloved book by Owen Colfer, is a fantastical, spellbinding adventure that follows the journey of 12-year-old genius Artemis Fowl, 
a descendant of a long line of criminal masterminds, as he seeks to find his father, who has mysteriously disappeared. With the help of his loyal protector, Butler, Artemis sets out to find him, and in doing so uncovers an ancient underground civilization, the amazingly advanced world of fairies. Deducing that his father's disappearance is somehow connected to the secretive, reclusive fairy world, cunning Artemis concocts a dangerous plan, so dangerous that he ultimately finds himself in a perilous war of wits with the all-powerful fairies. No longer does the story begin and initially revolve around Artemis being a criminal genius who's just looking to plan a heist to get rich quick. He's now just a boy looking to be reunited with his father. He's not robbing the people out of greed, but to just reunite his family. Remember earlier when I mentioned that Disney villains aren't nuanced or actually very evil? By acquiring the film rights to Artemis Fowl, Disney suddenly found themselves in a situation where for the first book, the main character is also the villain and does some kind of messed up things even though he's not evil. Artemis kidnaps, drugs, and mentally manipulates Holly throughout the first book, and the novel even has Artemis acknowledge at multiple times how uncomfortable and inhumane this behavior is. So Mama Disney must have been clutching her pearls at the thought of her newly acquired children's series where the main character is actually the bad guy who does actually bad things, and insisted that the first two books be combined for the first film adaptation instead of just the one. Because the second book does have an actual villain, Opal Cowboy, and Artemis acts much less villainous throughout its plot. By combining the first two books, Disney avoids having to make Artemis the bad guy and leaves room for the adaptation to sand off the less savory aspects of the story to make it more kid-friendly and marketable. No need for nuance when you can just have Artemis' kidnapping of Holly be a misunderstanding perpetrated by a boy simply looking to find his dad instead of a greedy criminal looking for some easy money. This is still mostly just speculation at this point, but I'm already more than a little disappointed by what has been confirmed. Disney's own synopsis shows they're already discarding a lot of the villainous aspects of the first book in Artemis Fowl's character, which sucks because that's what made that first book so great. Artemis Fowl wasn't some goody two-shoes who just sort of accidentally stumbles upon the fairy people. He's a criminal genius who hunts them down and holds them ransom, and he pulls it off too. He's like a mix of Goldfinger and Blofeld, all wrapped up in a child genius's body. That's what made him so cool. I didn't want to read just another boring story about a kid with a heart of gold who saves the day. I wanted to read a story about a kid who'd rob you for your heart of gold instead, all the while being three steps ahead of everybody. Like with movie Hermione and her physical appearance, Disney's Artemis Fowl seems to be removing unique and interesting characteristics of Artemis's character in order to make the film more palatable to more people. Disney's adaptation already feels like it's just playing everything safe as to make their movie as marketable and acceptable to uptight suburban moms as possible, and I can't shake the feeling that the end result is just going to be a middle-of-the-road, unremarkable film that's not exceptional enough to appeal to anyone. I'm going to have to wait and see the end product before I can truly cast final judgment on this adaptation, but as of what we know now, it's just disappointing to see Hollywood and Disney abandon what was once a unique and intriguing children's book for just another carbon copy assembly line kid-starring action flick. Again.